Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining uh, the monthly ARCA crypto market call. Uh, I'm Jeff Dorman. I'm Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer at ARCA, joined as always uh, by Nick Coates on the ARCA research side to talk about what's going on in the market. Um, you know, for those who have never joined before, uh, obviously ARCA puts out a lot of commentary, some private only for our LPs, some public for everyone. Uh, the point of this call, though, on a monthly series is to really dive deeper uh, uh, into the specific factors, um, the data that we're using to see all this stuff, and what's driving the crypto markets. Um, you know, again, three, four years ago, maybe the market audience wasn't sophisticated enough to really go deep. They were kind of just looking at Bitcoin and ETH only. Uh, now, obviously, uh, seven years into this, uh, we want to really dive deeper into 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 the big factors here. Let people uh, who want to invest on their own see where some of the data is that we're finding. Uh, shout out to some of the crypto partners we use, uh, et cetera. So before we get started here on uh, on, on pretty volatile uh, crypto markets, quick disclaimer as always, this commentary is provided to general information only and is not intended as investment advice. All right, Nick, pretty good, uh, pretty good sell-off in crypto. Uh, pretty good sell-off in all markets, really. Uh, what did you see uh, specifically, I guess you could say all of last week, uh, but specifically uh, Sunday and Monday? Yeah, I mean, it was a uh, it was definitely a crazy week. Um, one of the one of the craziest I can remember, having been uh, in in markets for a decade now. Um, but yeah, I mean, so so late last week we had the kind of trickling fears of the U.S. recession that were building up, and you had that uh, the jobs data that came out and got people a little scared. You had the unemployment rate tick up, um, and then over the weekend it just seemed like people started to get even more uh, fearful. And then you you really had stuff emerging about the, the yen carry trade and uh, all this stuff coming out of Japan over the weekend. Did, where... did, 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 did you say a little scared? Uh, the chart you're showing here shows that this was the third highest VIX uh, of the last, what, 50 years? I'd say that's a little more than a little scared. That was Fair. complete and ridiculous fear trade. Fair meltdown was was probably a better a better term than a little scared. I mean, yeah, I, you know, and look at look at these, you know, what it was comparable to, right? I think this didn't even reach the high of how much how much it actually was because it got up to sixty five on the VIX. Um, so this isn't as high as it actually was at the peak. But yeah, I mean, you've got the the COVID lockdowns, you've got the global financial crisis, and then Black Monday in nineteen eighty seven on the very far left there. I mean, that's what you're talking about comparing this to in terms of the amount of volatility. Yeah, so so you're talking about an event with the largest stock market correction in history, down twenty five percent a single day. You have the global financial crisis, which was effectively a complete bank and real estate meltdown, and then you had a once in a what. 300 year pandemic that basically stopped economic activity to a halt yeah. in one day at that point where people thought you know millions yeah we're gonna die yeah yeah. And, I mean, and, was... and, yeah and the market compared that uh on last week to a couple of hedge funds getting caught up in a yen carry trade unwind and a slightly higher unemployment rate so pretty absurd in terms of the magnitude, I mean, again, you can point to the fact that anytime you have real uh, long periods of low volatility, which we had, I don't remember the exact dates, but it was something like several hundred days or maybe a hundred plus days in a row in the equity market of less than 1% move. So, you know, you had a subdued vol environment, which means that anytime you have sort of a shock to the system, you're going to have an overreaction. But you know, this was up there in my 25 year career now as being one of the most ridiculous reactions I've ever seen across global markets. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I think I saw some comparisons to the the twenty twenty or sorry the twenty fifteen uh, time frame where you got you can kind of see it on that on that little chart there. But that was when you had the oil oil kind of shocks where or it was the it was the demand slowdown. Oil was getting pummeled, and then you had China uh, concerns like that their economy was slowing. And I think you had VIX get to like forty or fifty um, really quickly, and then retrace almost immediately. And so it it feels a lot like that. I mean with you got to 65 here in one day and then are basically by the end of the week, nearly back to kind of standard levels. Yeah. I think 2015 is probably a, a good comp. Um, you know, for those not familiar with this Japanese yen carry trade, uh, which for those who don't know, just basically means, you know, when interest rates are really low in one part of the world and higher other places, you borrow where the low interest rate is in Japan, you borrow in yen, uh, and then you invest in the higher interest rates in dollars. So what happens is when the yen starts to appreciate, 
uh, against the dollar, which it did in a very fast fashion. Uh, that trade gets blown up. Uh, all of a sudden, you have to unwind all that leverage. Uh, and this started, of course, because the BOJ raised basis, uh, raised a uh, raised a quarter uh, of a percentage point. Um, this is not a new trade. Uh, the Japanese yen carry trade has been going on for essentially 20 years. Uh, rates uh, in Japan have been negative um, or zero for 20 years. Um, obviously, the only reason it stopped for a little while is because rates were also zero or negative everywhere else in the world too. Um, but you know, with the inflation fighting. Um, you know, Fed and other central banks raising rates, that trade came back in vogue. 2015 was the last time it was really in vogue. And you saw a very similar uh, thing happening there with Abenomics, where everybody was, you know, borrowing yen at, at zero rates and loading up on Japanese equities. So very similar to 2015, I agree. Yeah. Um, I mean, and and it seems like now a lot of the pieces are in place to kind of take a step back from this. I mean, you have the, the BOJ came out and said that they're not going to be thinking about raising rates anymore. Seems like the Fed might be coming out a little bit more dovish. You had some better like uh, business data coming out as well on Friday. So, um, you know, you've been keeping track of kind of the pieces you were looking for to to see this as being over from a macro standpoint. Where do you think we are with that? Well, let's let's go to the next slide here. I mean, that's really the question, right? So, so the question is, was this a technical unwind, right? Anybody here who's on this call obviously is involved in the crypto markets. You see leverage flush outs all the time. You track finance futures. You see, you know, the liquidations. You see those charts that say a hundred million dollars was liquidated today or a billion dollars was liquidated. It happens in crypto all the time. It's a very levered market. You don't see it as much uh, in the traditional markets, even though it does happen once in a while. But that's essentially all that happened with the yen carry trade. Is you had a bunch of leverage. Uh, that was unwound. Collateral had to be sold, which was Japanese equities as well as U.S. equities. Um, and the question is, was this a, just a technical unwind, which is a reset and time to go start buying again? Or was there other bigger factors behind this? Um, the things I was looking for to determine whether it was technical or not was, um, are we going to see Japanese equities bounce back? And we saw that. Um, are we going to see um, anything break? Right. Are we going to see something like, you know, FX or, you know, uh, repo rates kind of break and have, you know, somebody have to step in um, and fix it, meaning like, you know, a combination of the Treasury or the Fed or, you know, we already saw uh, the BOJ back down, um, you know, or are we going to, uh, uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, have any sort of like Fed soothing, right, any sort of uh, uh, government interaction, I guess to just sort of soothe markets without sort of a panic cut come in? Um, and are we going to see, you know, the economic data really implode? Um, and right, right now, all three of the things I'd be looking for to say that this was just technical have already happened, right? The Nikkei is already back to where it was pre-Sunday. You've had the Fed, you know, many Fed governors coming out saying, yeah, we're probably going to cut rates, but not like some emergency crazy um, uh, 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 rate cut. Um, you already saw the BOJ back down saying that our, our our tightening is already basically over. We're not going to just panic markets by continuing to raise rates. Uh, and on top of that, I was looking for the crypto specific, like, are we going to get some ETF inflows? And we definitely did. So to me, this is 100% technical. The one remaining question, which is what you have on the slide here, is was this this was the uh, jobs data last Friday the first move in what is ultimately going to be a recession? And I think you and I both agree that we haven't seen a lot of indicators that suggest that we're anywhere near recessionary, given that, you know, second quarter earnings were fine. Um, you know, for those who have been out in the real world, I mean, airports are packed, restaurants are packed, people still have jobs. There's no real panic. Um, we even saw the ISM numbers show some strength on Monday. I guess the SOM rule being triggered is probably the biggest indicator. Um, and maybe, you know, treasury yield, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the only thing you're hanging on if you really believe like recession is imminent here. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was a macro analyst for three years, and I can tell you that we were certainly not looking at labor data to use as like a forecasting tool to predict a recession. Like labor data to me is is always a lagging indicator. And so you would look for something like market pricing. And if you're getting into economic data, maybe stuff like um, business business surveys like the ISM or um, some other leading indicator to like actually try to be a step ahead. Labor data to me is always late. So it was really weird for me to see on, on Thursday or Friday that my, the market respond to that jobs data so negatively like a growth scare, which, and I was, I was talking in, in our portfolio meeting. I'm like, I don't understand this. This doesn't make any sense to me. Why are we selling off 
on, on this, which usually the market doesn't care. The, the market cares about jobs data in the context of what the Fed is going to do. It usually doesn't care about jobs data in the context of growth. Um, and so I was like, what? There's got to be something else going on here. So explain the, explain the two charts here we, that we have here and on the next slide, though. Like what, what was the market trying to make a case for the recession based on the jobs data? So the SOM rule is basically just saying it's just like a like a momentum indicator on the unemployment rate. So it's saying is the momentum or is the momentum of unemployment trending up, i.e. is the unemployment rate rising? Um, and, and you basically had there's a there's a specific point, like half a percent or something based on two different moving averages. Once you get to that point, the rule triggers and that it's been a perfect track record in the past of predicting recession, I would say, like. Every, every recession I've gone through, you've, you've seen there was always some indicator that was a perfect indicator, and then it doesn't work at some point. Um, the right. yield curve. Uh, yeah, I was going to say perfect indicator out of like, what, 12 or 13 recessions. So it's not like it's, you know, hundred, it's not like hundreds of data points here. Yep. And if you go to the next slide, um, you know, the yield curve being another perfect example where it works perfectly since 1970 or whatever. But if you get data going back further, when you had more inflation, when you had a more volatile economy, things like that, it never worked. So, you know, here we've got the 210 yield curve about to uninvert. That's typically a sign of uh, a recession as well. You know, you could note though other yield curves like the 10 year, uh, three months, which is more tied to what the Fed is actually going to do. That's not even close to inverting or uninverting. Yeah, and I think this is the, you know, as you just get annihilated with data in the last, you know, 10 plus years when everybody has access to the same information and it can spread like wildfire, um, there have always been, you know, signs and, and, and triggers that, that, that both macro investors as well as just global investors in general look at. And they don't always mean something, but they can mean something, right? So I, I, think, I think a little bit of a market reaction based on these two things is certainly warranted. Um, but again, the, the, the immediate, you know, we're heading into a recession immediately and the yen carry trade is going to unwind and kill everybody. <laughs> Excuse me. A little bit of an overreaction. Yeah. Yeah. Don't disagree. I think, you know, we, we definitely were starting to price for perfection. People were getting pretty overly optimistic in the, in the equity markets and the, in the tech space, stuff like that. Um, in the mag seven, pretty concentrated, but. I, I don't think the the data that we've seen is nearly warranted the the, uh, the reaction we've had. Okay, so you mentioned that jobless claims. You know, I, actually, as we're talking here on Thursday, August eighth, jobless claims came out this morning. The weekly jobless claims, pretty benign. Um, you know, have to wait three more weeks for the next actual jobs report and employment data. Um, but you know, you mentioned that usually jobs data is related more to what the Fed is going to do, not necessarily what the economy is actually doing. So let's talk about that. So what what is what are the expectations of the Fed going forward here? And what does that mean in terms of at least equity that maybe crypto? Going on to the yeah. next slide here. If you jump, yeah, next slide. Um, so right now you've got, I mean, you've had a really material uh, repricing of rates. So you had rate cut chances for September uh, kind of picking up all year, really just moving slowly and then dramatically increasing over the last week here. Uh, so we were previously pricing in uh, one, one cut or 25 basis points. Uh, now it's a 100% chance of two cuts, so 50 basis points, and then coming through with another 50 basis points by December. So it's really moved quickly. I think you were prior to this week, it was, it was somewhere between one and two, so 25 to 50 by the end of the year, and you've over doubled that uh, just in the last week here. Yeah, and I think it's worth noting as well. I mean, you know, the market is already snipping this out, right? You had the two-year and the 10-year, you know, trading briefly below 4%, but even comfortably at 4% now. You got a good 100 basis points of room here uh, pretty easily for the Fed, um, not to mention with inflation sort of in that 2 and a half to 3% range. You know, certainly a couple hundred basis points of room with regard to, um, you know, where real rates would still be positive. Uh, you know, we saw on Monday morning uh, uh, some just doomsdayers coming out on CNBC. I remember I was on the treadmill at 5 a.m. They were saying, we need an emergency 75 basis points cut. I'm like, what are we talking about? Like, this is just insane how fast it went to panic. Um, uh, you know, I think the Fed actually, to their credit, has been incredibly transparent. This is what's actually been the most interesting to me over the last 10 years versus my first 15 years in, in the markets was the Fed used to be a little more of a wild card, certainly under the Greenspan era and Bernanke. You, you just didn't really always know what they were thinking. Whereas 
Uh, the Powell Fed has been the most transparent in history. Like there are no curveballs. They tell you exactly what they're doing before they do it. Uh, and you also have, uh, you know, Nick at the Wall Street Journal, basically their their mouthpiece telling you exactly what they're going to do. So the market continues to try to predict crazy things and they just don't do it. So I was actually pretty relieved this week to see nothing from the Fed. Just sort of, yeah, well, we're going to wait till this September meeting and we'll go from there. And it's probably going to be a cut, but maybe not. But eventually the next move is going to be a cut. So um, I thought that was actually probably more calming to the market than if you actually saw some sort of a panic reaction. Yeah, I mean, I think there's this narrative that the Fed is like a tied at the hip to what the stock market is doing. And I just don't think that's true. Pe what people are getting at or what they should be trying to get at is they're tried to, trying to make sure the treasury market functions. And you, you haven't had any like problems in the markets. I mean, sure, a lot of macro traders got blown out, you know, doing the end carry trade, but like it doesn't really matter to their mandate. And so they did what they should be doing, which is nothing in, the, in a case like this. Yeah, moving on to the next slide. I mean, this is where it gets interesting is that, um, you know, this is a really good chart. Shout out to, uh, if you don't follow Charlie Bolello um, at Creative Planning, probably the, the best data uh, statistician I, I've seen. Um, in, in terms of real-time information on, on, on the economy and, 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 and stocks. A really good chart here showing that there's different types of rate cuts. Um, if you get a rate cut, um, basically because the job of fighting inflation is over and the economy is still fine and you have a soft landing, generally rate cuts tend to spur economic activity and lead to uh, growth. That's what you saw in 2019, 1998, 1995. But if you get sort of panic rate cuts because you're late, um, which is what we saw heading into the recession of 2001 and 2007, um, where it was clear the Fed waited too long, it was clear that they had to act um, reactionary rather than proactively, you can see it gets pretty nasty thereafter. And I think that's probably the biggest ex explanation for why the market really panicked um, Thursday, Friday, and Monday, um, was there was this common view that the Fed was late and this jobs report confirmed that. So it is possible. It's 100% possible. I don't think there's any other data points that suggest that's happening, but um, you know that would be the, the that would be the correct response if you thought that. But again, you know we had Japanese Nikkei was down twelve and a half percent in a day. Uh, U.S. futures were down six and a half percent on Sunday night. You look at the chart. I mean, basically, you know the entire what one and two year uh, uh, returns if it was too late being priced in a single day. So again, it seems like an overreaction regardless, um, uh, and, and certainly a good buying opportunity whether that be equities, crypto. Um, uh, or or any other risk factors. Now, the one thing that is interesting before we get into kind of what else is driving markets is that, um, you know, I think it is probably the biggest beta response we've ever seen um, in terms of equity markets have essentially retraced the move already. Rates markets have essentially retraced the move already. Yet crypto is still down, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 um, percent from from that Sunday sell off. So. That's a big overreaction. Even even if you go back to the COVID March 2020 trade, when ETH was down like 52% in a month, the S&P was also down 26%. So it was still about a 2x beta. Right now, if you graph, you know, ETH or, uh, uh, you know, small caps, um, you know, I'll, I'll exclude Bitcoin and Seoul who have traded certainly much better. But if you look at mostly, um, you know, Ethereum and, and, and other sectors, DeFi, gaming, whatever, basically a 5x reaction to stocks in the last week which is certainly uh, out of the norm uh, in terms of market type moves. So so we talked about the economy. Let's move on to the next chart here. You know, what else are we looking at? Is there anything else that could maybe be driving this crypto specific sell off relative to equities and rates? I mean, it can't just be the Fed and the jobs market, because, again, most of the other markets have retraced that move already. Yeah, I mean, this is what the market was focusing on, really, I think, prior to Friday was the was the odds of uh, Trump winning the election. and. You can see, I, not my favorite chart, honestly, but um, you can see in the dark red line that Trump's election chances on the right axis there. And then in the kind of back in the orange area chart is uh, is the Bitcoin price. And you can see a bit of a negative correlation there to uh, to Trump's odds. Um, you see in Harris actually take uh, take the lead on, on the poly market betting site uh, just yesterday night. So um you know the market obviously has been very much hinging on a trump win in the election uh you know for for a multitude of reasons not the least of which was him speaking really positively about bitcoin and, and crypto and the whole industry uh at bitcoin nashville two weeks ago or whatever it was um and just all of the potential deregulation and and um fav favor more favorable regulatory environment you can get uh from a republican administration 
Yeah, and shout out to the guys at Polymarket. Um, obviously, uh, a really big win um, for them as well as for you know use cases of of blockchain. Um, we'll see if it continues after the election, but certainly a, a, a lot of data um, being used for markets right now coming from Polymarket. Um, so moving on, uh, actually skip ahead maybe two slides here. Um, it's been it's been bad for crypto outside of and you know outside of Bitcoin and and to some extent you know Solana or Telegram and a few others. I mean, it's been pretty ugly out there for crypto um, really all year, right? I mean, this is sort of interesting. We came out of 2023, had a pretty decent year, not a great year, but decent year for crypto with Bitcoin leading. Everyone came into 2024. We're talking super cycle. We're talking bull market. We're talking all time highs. And meanwhile, it's been like if you own six tokens, you're up for the year, but everything else is down 30 to 80 percent. What what does this dispersion mean anything to you in terms of, uh, you know, to quote a famous Mark Yusko quote, you know, that alligator jaws will eventually close? Um, you know, anything that we've seen in other markets that would suggest that maybe this blue line and orange line converge, maybe explain what these lines are. Yeah. So and the orange is the equal weighted uh, of the top 200 coins. So basically it's going to be a lot more smaller cap leaning than the blue line, which is market cap weighted. So, you know, that's going to be 60, 70% Bitcoin, another 15% ETH, something like that. Um, you know, this is this is true in the equity markets too, where you have these long periods of large caps outperforming. Think, you know, Mag Seven over the last, or you know, all the different names the Mag Seven has been called over the past fifteen years. You get just for entire years where that would just outperform significantly, and you've had a very very long period of outperformance over small caps. Um, but what you see throughout history is small caps really just catch up very very quickly. Uh, in the handful of months. And you can think back to um, you know, January to April of 2021 as a perfect example of that, where basically Bitcoin led for from the bottom in the end of 2018 through that time period. And then small caps way made it up uh, just in that four months. So you know, you've, you've had a very similar situation here. It's just been it kind of bleeds since March in, in the smaller cap tokens outside of, again, a few very select names. Um, but, you know, it, it's pretty typical. You see that in markets when when liquidity, when liquidity is drying up and, and there's not as much capital in the market. People are focusing on the more liquid names, um, the bigger cap names. And this is just what you see. But then when that liquidity comes back, these are the, you know, the higher beta names that people can chase. Yeah, and I'd also, you know, uh, we didn't put it out here, but you can certainly... Um, look at the equity market and, you know, go to trading view and graph it in yourself. Look at IWM, which is the Russell 2000 versus, you know, the NASDAQ. Um, and just look at how they looked incredibly similar for the last 12 months because of what you just said, the MAG7 um, and uh, leading the way. And then in about a week and a half, they converged completely, right? The NASDAQ dropped 10% and the Russell was up 8% in the same week. So you can see this uh, move pretty quickly. And I think what I'd be looking for as another crypto indicator here would be, um, are you starting to see some green shoes, right? Are you starting to see uh, uh, some signs that maybe some money is returning to other areas of the market besides just Bitcoin and Solana? Uh, you know, you might actually have seen it today. Um, for example, Ripple is up 25% uh, just on some positive regulatory um, news with regard to the SEC, you know, losing um, again uh, in court. Not really material for the Ripple token, but the fact that it's up 25% shows that, you know, there is some money to be spending on news again. And then also Telegram. Telegram got listed on Binance. We haven't seen a Binance or Coinbase listing affect markets in nine months. Uh, and all of a sudden, Telegram up 15% of the news of a Binance listing. So those are the kind of things that um, uh, I generally um, look for is like, can we see some green shoots? Are we going to start to see some some money trickling back into the the more beaten up areas? Again, I mentioned you know, Bitcoin's now up, what, 40% for the year, 30% for the year. ETH is basically flat. Solana's up 40. BNB and Telegram are up 50 to 100. And then pretty much everything else is down, you know, with a few exceptions, uh, like like are we, with a few exceptions, everything else is down, you know, 30 day, 60%. So pretty big year-to-date dispersion here. And I would expect to see some bottom fishing eventually here. Uh, and we're looking for those green shoots to see if maybe in a couple months that blue and orange line start to converge. Okay, speaking, uh, sticking with the crypto stuff specifically, um, you know, anything else we're looking at uh, in terms of themes or data that's sort of supporting either, you know, continued sell-off here or maybe a bit of, bit of a rebound? Yeah, I don't know if this 
goes either way. I think this is more of a long term uh, piece here. But just looking at, I was I was just surprised to see this this number coming out. I, you know, you had as you mentioned the bullish conditions uh, late last year, kind of early this year, but you really haven't seen that at all in the private markets. And basically every VC counterpart I talked to is like dead dead board right now. Um, but they they really the fundraising has not really gotten close to the levels that we saw in 2021 2022. In fact, it's really barely off the highs. Um, and yeah, I'm not really sure if that makes a, a bullish or bearish case. It's just something I was I was a little surprised to see that you haven't seen that uh, number start to tick up more. Yeah, I think probably a little bit of a lagging indicator, as you said. Um, okay. Could be true, yeah. Yeah. Okay, moving uh, on. Uh, Go ahead. Yep. Um, uh, you know, this is one I've, I've shown before, I think, uh, just showing the uh, the amount of driving of, of meme coins in some of the different ecosystems. You know, two of the ones that have been more successful recently have been Solana and Base, uh, and, and meme coins just continue to account for a lot of uh, the volume there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, pretty obvious why Solana has been outperforming, you know, as metrics have started to converge to and even surpass Ethereum led by the meme coins. Um, just, you know, for a little bit teaser to anyone, like what would, you know, you can easily buy Sol to take advantage of that. What would people be buying to take advantage of the fact that Base is basically seeing the same thing, but maybe not getting as much uh, a notice? Yeah, there isn't there isn't as much that's kind of like at notably to notable tokens. I think the two would be Aerodrome, the DEX, um, the, which is the biggest DAX and maybe um, the uh, the Farcaster token the, or the their meme coin, it's like DGen. Those would be the two that stick out in my mind. Okay. Uh, moving ahead here, we mentioned Polymarket already. Maybe another, just show the graph here uh, on the next slide. Um, you know, Polymarket certainly booming on the next slide here, please. Uh, you know, the, we've seen these flash in the pans before. Uh, with prediction markets across crypto. We've also seen tons of uh, prediction markets without crypto um, over the years always spike around elections, then kind of go back to nothing. Um, what are you seeing specific to poly market here? Anything that makes you think that this would continue once the election is over here in the US? It's, it's mostly election related markets. And, and shout out to Richard Chen on this uh, on this Dune dashboard. You know, I, I showed this exact same one last uh, last time we did this, and all the numbers are way, way up since then, as you can see. So, um, I mean, this continues to be something I see permeating mainstream consciousness, like normal people using poly market to uh, to talk about the election, um, which is which is definitely really cool and cool to see that kind of crypto uh, use case. But, but yeah, I mean, I would say that ninety to ninety five percent of the activity on poly market is election related. So they they really need to kind of figure out what. Uh, you know how to expand beyond that political niche to uh, to really keep that traction beyond the election. Yeah, I think that's the issue. You know, when you talk about crypto use cases, you know, there's been a couple that have been persistent, right? DeFi continues to be used, you know, every day. Uh, stable coins continue to be used every day. Um, a lot of other ones have kind of come and gone. When you look at you know, over the last nine months or so, really since kind of the market took off at the end of 2023. Um, yeah, a lot of the themes and narratives that typically traders have been trading on um, and, and, and have made money on in 2020 and 21, similar things. The problem is they're all lasting four to six weeks and then you never hear about them again, right? Whether that's social fi, um, things like friend tech, um, or it's RWAs, uh, like the growth in you know treasury money markets, but nothing really outside of that, uh, or it's gaming or it's poly market. Like, um, is this just sort of the nature of what... Um, we're going to see in crypto right now is a lot of fits and starts until you get real traction. Um, is there anything to glean from maybe on the next slide here? Is there anything to glean from just overall blockchain activity that doesn't really matter which apps are used as long as overall activity is high? Um, you know, I know there's a lot of Ethereum hatred out there right now, especially with regard to um, how the L2s have kind of cannibalized fees. You know, what are, what are you seeing just sort of overall blockchain usage and, and, and themes and narratives that matter? Yeah, this this is an interesting one um, that I that I track. It's a, a more of a longer term perspective. Um, you know, you've really seen fee, this is fees per active address, so not necessarily fees per user, but kind of a decent proxy for that. Um, you, but not really reaching you know new highs. You had these these highs made in it's the amount of fees that that people were paying on average in 2021 and 2022. 
and you've never really gotten close to that. In fact, you're kind of close to the recent lows. So to, from, from one aspect, yeah, I think that's like, there isn't really that new narrative to latch onto that's been driving fees. Um, certainly not, not on Ethereum outside of meme coins really, but you, it, it's been, it's definitely been slow on the activity standpoint. Um, the other hand of that is that the blockchains themselves have just gotten so much better that the average person is using a blockchain that, you know, instead of you paying $10 in gas fees or $20 in gas fees, you're paying, you know, a cent or less. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of both dual edged sword where the demand side has not really been there, but also the supply side, you know, the improvement in, in user experience has been uh, pretty notable. So you've had fees falling across the board as a result. Okay, let's end on a couple. Uh, let's let you really nerd out here in the crypto world. Anything specific that you're seeing here, uh, maybe a little more off the run, uh, that the people listening here can sink their teeth into. Yeah. Uh, so Hive Mapper is one I've I've brought up before. I think it's one of the coolest kind of real world use cases, or one that is is much more material that you can talk to your grandma about a little bit. But Hive Mapper is a is a project where you put a uh, a dash cam on your car. And it takes pictures of the road as you're driving around, and then it uses Hive Mapper uses all that data. Um, it gets it synthesized, analyzed, and everything, and then they sell the data to people who want to create maps. Um, and the the cool thing here is that again, you've got you've got so many people. You're using this this crypto incentive to get people to to participate. Um, but I think they've got a few tens of thousands of of total people. But I mean, they've already mapped in, I think it's just a bit over a year, they've mapped a quarter of the world, which I was like blown away. I think I, I read that it took Google Maps like a decade or something to get most of the world. So Hive Mapper has been on a way, very, way faster trajectory than, than Google Maps has. Um, I mean, this number was at 10%, what, probably six months ago. So I, I've just been impressed with their progress. Um, it hasn't necessarily translated into the demand side yet. You're seeing some early indications of that, but um, just the, the the comprehensive nature of what they're building and then the quality, the, the repetition that you can have by having different cars uh, going by the same spot at different times uh, can really create value beyond what you have with the current mapping infrastructure, which I think is pretty cool. How do, how do you make this grow more? You got to get like, you know, when Jeeps pass each other and they wave to each other, do you have to have like some sort of Hive Mapper logo on your car to get people to care when you pass them with a Hive Mapper uh, mapping device? Like, how do you, how yeah, do you think this really, or, or is the crypto incentives the, enough? Get it on the floor of a basketball arena. Uh, no, I mean, I, look, I think it's it's going to need the, it's, it's part of a reflexivity with the price. Um, you, you've had the growth on the supply side and now you just need to see that follow through on, on the demand side. You need to see, these big partnerships and selling data to, you know, real companies. And, and that will, I think be, uh, you know, that will help the price. And then that also incentivizes more people to, to get on board and, and to start mapping. So uh, you have this reflective nature. It's a good thing. Sometimes the bad thing, you know, others, and, and that kind of includes right now, but despite that, you've got some pretty impressive growth of the actual coverage. And I can say, you know, for someone who speaks to institutional investors, LPs, you know, people who are not crypto native, Hive Mapper, one of maybe five real world kind of blockchain use cases that I can talk to that people immediately understand. Um, so certainly something that if it does start to have real growth and traction, as it seems to be doing, you know, one that the, the, the rest of the world can latch on to. Um, okay, I'll admit on the last slide here, moving ahead, I don't have a clue what this is. You snuck this in without me even seeing. So educate me as you educate the audience. Yeah, not not really talking about things that other people understand here. So this was just like I thought was pretty cool. Um, the, like amid amid a, a sea of of not not too much going on in the space right now. But the uh this concept of futarchy has been talked about for for a while now in in crypto. And it's basically the idea of having a market govern rather than having people vote on something. So it would be in this this situation you have um. People, you ask a question of like, is this policy going to improve society based on some metric? And then people would vote with dollars. You basically create a market to determine whether that would be positive or negative based on some framework. So you have this DAO in Solana called MetaDAO that is, the Futarchy concept, by the way, has been around for decades. Um, it's never been tried before. 
but this DAO uh, on Solana is is now trying this as a service for other DAOs, and this is something where you know DAOs are kind of a dirty word in in the mind of a lot of crypto uh, natives because they just really have been you know slow, then chaotic. Um, it, they just really haven't been a very efficient way to you know d govern these these platforms that we have. Um, so what this is providing is a way to create a market on a any contentious sort of uh, governance vote. So say there's you know a vote to add to create it or to have a new CEO to replace the CEO of the of the lab team or something like that, or then have a new uh, a new person at the helm of the project. You can create a market and it would say, is the price of the token going to be higher if we pass this vote, or is it going to be lower? And then the market says, you know, conditional on these things happening, what do you think the price of the token is going to be? And if you have a strong view on what that's going to be, you can bet on it via MetaDAO and you can kind of enact whether that happens or not. Because at the end of the process, whichever one of those is priced higher, you know, pass or fail of that, of that um, governance vote, that will be what is enacted. So... I don't know. I thought it was a super cool concept. Definitely moving away from what is super realistic uh, and super tangible to people. But just, I mean, I think it's awesome to see this cool, you know, very deep level experimentation. This is what gets me going uh, on on crypto stuff at the end of the day. So um, just cool, cool to see stuff like this going on. Very good. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for this month. Obviously, we didn't touch on everything. I think, you know, certainly those who follow us uh, on Twitter have been putting a lot out there. Uh, we have a fair amount of the blogs on the website as well. We'll be back again next month with, with what else is going on. Um, but, you know, usually this is more inf informational than anything. I think in this case, you know, again, not investment advice, but feels pretty clear that this is a bit of an overreaction. So I uh, can't tell you what to do. I can tell you what ARK has been doing, uh, which has been buying the dip. And then we'll, we'll see how that works out over the next month or so. So appreciate everybody uh, coming out and listening. Nick, as always, thanks for providing all the data uh, and all the information. Uh, Sumana from our marketing side, thanks for putting this together. And we'll be back again next month. Thank you, everybody.